board and um i have a well like i said i've got quite a few things that i want to talk about mm -hmm. um yeah so let's get started let's get started so excited i get i don't know why i get so excited about talking to you <laughs> Me either i don't know either <laughs> <laughs> it's so good um so uh there's so many <laughs> so, good. so many different things that I want to talk about. I really um appreciated going through the chakras and the chakra system with you and getting a better understanding. Um and and, and so now I want to shift a little bit because there's so much, so much that I want to talk about. But before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit about the blue zone and I want to talk a bit about the China study, things like that. But before we get into that, I have a, a dear friend who I've known practically all my life and um, made a phone call just to check and see how she was doing because she's been walking around for several years with an oxygen. She wears oxygen all the time now. And um, she says to me in the midst of the conversation as resolute as she wanted to be, she's maybe um, four years older than me. I think she's maybe, you know, so she's not that old. And um, she says to me at a certain point in the conversation, she says, I think I am, or she probably already had, signing up for palpative care. And palliative. Said, palliative care. Okay, thank you for correcting me. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, what? You know, are we there? That was, you know, I'm I'm so irreverent about stuff. Um, and I just always think that it's my place to be. And um, and so we started having the conversation, and I asked her if she had felt that she had done all that she could to change around the circumstances. And she told me, she says, I've done what the doctors told me. And so I asked her, I said, have you tried changing your diet? And she was like, Do you, have you seen me? You know, I'm at about 100 pounds right now. And um, she started telling me about, about the only thing that she usually is able to get down in during the course of a day is her big breakfast. And so I asked her, I said, what is that? And she started telling me eggs, bacon, a bagel with cream cheese. Um, I think she says coffee with cream and her insure. And I was like, I said, is there anything that you're taking that's not causing you the excess mucus that you're <laughs> that you get from this diet? And she was like, what? <laughs> And I said, everything that you named is probably making you even sicker, which in her mind, that did not compute. As a matter of fact, because her weight is so low, she was rather upset about what I said and then said that that's what she could eat. Um, and wanted to know why I thought that her diet might be causing her some of the problems that she has. Now, granted, I don't know any or a lot of stuff about her, um, about the condition. But like I said, she's been on oxygen for years. What do you say um, in a situation like that? If you, because you don't know her um, and she's not necessarily on Facebook. So we don't necessarily, um, I'm not necessarily concerned about 
hurting her feelings. But if this was somebody that you were just given some straight talk to, how would you, how would you approach something like that? As a good friend, you asked her, do you think something in your diet is causing this? And her reaction was one of bewilderment, but like, I'm not equating my health with what I eat. Then ask her in detail, okay, so I know you don't eat much. You have this one meal a day. What is it that you're eating? She tells you, and then you make another point. Is there anything that in there that's not hurting you? And with that reaction that you got, I would have stopped. Mm. Because there is a certain tipping point in our health such that there's no coming back from the brink. And when people are going into hospice or palliative care, which means going to keep you comfortable we're not expecting you to get better. And then you approach them with an alternative, but their first reaction is, I don't see a relationship to that at all. You push again further and then there's resistance. The window for receptivity mm -hmm. and making the change to bring them back from the brink is pretty much closed. So I, it's like telling somebody with oxygen who has lung cancer to stop smoking. No, enjoy yourself. This is, you're not coming back from this. Mm. Enjoy yourself. And sometimes the the, the, the family's insistence at making these changes because the family is uncomfortable with the way things are going mm -hmm. causes more tension in the patient or the person which can actually hasten their demise because of the conflict. Mm. Let them enjoy themselves and let them go, recognizing they'll be back. Mm. They will be back to do this again. So you could simply just plant the seed and just let it go. That sometimes food can be our medicine and sometimes it's not. And let it go. Mm. So that's, yeah. So, so bringing up the topic at this stage and then seeing the, the, the knee-jerk reaction yeah, okay. I don't see the receptivity. I don't want to cause you more tension. I don't want to disrupt the harmonious relationship that we have. I'm here for you. Whatever you need, I'm not going to push this issue. Mm. Okay. And um, and so maybe that has been, <laughs> maybe that's been one of my uh, issues is that um, sometimes I have this tendency to push and um, yeah, okay, good. So thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. You have been down this path uh, uh, so many more times than I, and um, and sometimes I feel as if I want to, you know, I always say that what comes up for me comes out, and so I I usually have a tendency to say exactly what is on my mind. So. When I watched a series, because you have been telling me about Blue Zones, I watched a series on that is on Netflix on the Blue Zones or Living to Be 100. Have you seen that? I have um, not watched it. I have noticed the title and I put it in my queue of things to watch. 
Yes. Okay. Um, and so the man who documented this film visited what he called blue zones around the world and was curious about how people or how the zone became blue. Can you tell us what a blue zone is? Sure. A blue zone is an area in the world where the average age of death is 100 plus. So that means some people are above 100 and some people are below 100, but averaging them together, most people in blue zones live to be 100. And there's five documented blue zones. There's one in a small place in Greece. There's one in a small place in Italy. There's one in Okinawa, Japan. There is one in a small area of Costa Rica. And the fifth one is in Loma Linda, California, the uh, national home of the Seventh-day Adventists. And their characteristics of all five of those communities, which scientists attribute to the longevity. And so what would, if say for instance, we were trying to figure out what they may be doing right and what we may be doing wrong, um, because I, as far as I can see, um, most people don't have, and, and I wonder if they are even conscious that, oh, I'm approaching 100 or I want to live to be 100 plus. What is it possibly that um, is different? It's there. They had, so to your point where you're saying, um, oh, I'm about to be 100. No, that's their culture. So that's not a milestone. Like we look at it as, oh, a hundred milestone. Nah, that's just our life here. This is how it is. So some of the things is they still all the way up until time of death use natural movement in all that they do. So they sweep instead of mainly vacuum. They wash dishes instead of using a washing uh, uh, a um, dishwasher. Some of them naturally wash their clothes um, outside. So they don't use uh, an automatic dryer and washer all the time. Or if they use a washing machine, they hang their clothes outside. They walk mainly to a lot of the places where they go. So as opposed to us who lead a certain kind of life where we need a gym me membership so that we can get our exercise in, this is already a part of their lifestyle, natural movement. Then they also have uh, built into their culture automatic stress relief. So they have regular rituals for their ancestors um, taking some of their problems to, taking some of their questions to. So that gives them a, a certain sense of knowingness. I can count on answers. I can count on help. They also take naps on a regular basis. They pray on a regular basis. And in um, the couple of communities that drink, they have happy hours. So they automatically built into their lives stress relief. All of them, no matter what age, always had a purpose in life. So though they may retire, they may still be the patriarch or the matriarch of the family. They still will do and be actively engaged in the community and are considered respected elders and voices of reason. So they have a reason to get up every day and do something. 80%, um, no, I'm sorry, their smallest, their biggest meal 
is in the morning and they only eat, they don't eat until they're full. They eat until they're almost full, about 80% full. And then their smallest meal is late afternoon or early evening, such that when they're going to bed, they're not trying to digest food. That has already happened. They also, all of them, have a plant-based diet, which mainly consists of beans and lentils as the foundation. If they eat month, if they eat meat, it's no more than five times a month, and it's the size of a deck of cards, four ounces. Four ounces, five times a month, max. Otherwise, it's a plant-based diet. Other than the Seventh-day Adventists, these people drank wine, one to two glasses per day with a meal and with friends and family. They did not drink by themselves. It was part of a, in a, in a group context as they're socializing and engaging and interacting. And then there was this philosophy of the right tribe. You are either born or you choose to join a group that support all of your healthy behaviors. You're not the lone wolf out there. You're not the different one. You have a support group that's doing everything just like you, which makes it normal. And then they have another philosophy called loved ones first. That means that the aging parents and grandparents are kept at home, they're not put in a nursing home. They are committed to a life partner. So they've got somebody to share their experiences with and time with. And they invest lots and lots of energy in the children, loved ones first. Mm. So those are about the, the, the eight basic principles that the scientists have outlined as to why these people have in their culture this longevity that the rest of the world does not enjoy. Oh, that's, um, that's really interesting. And it's good. Um, this idea that, um, well, there's so much to dig into um, when it comes to that. Um, first off, this idea about movement movement and um, one of the things that i saw in the series was is that they talked about this idea about how our environment impacts our level of um movement or exertion or or how it is that we move so if the longest walk that we take is from our back door to our car door. Um, we don't get very much in the way of exercise because all we're doing is, you know, what is that maybe for, for so many um, 40 to 50 steps. And walking um, is one of the best exercises for a human being to do. Mm -hmm. It is natural to us, and it's so very effective at moving all parts of our body, engaging the cardiovascular system, and increasing endorphins. It works in all levels. It's a simple thing to do. Mm. And but but you know, in our society, the way that it's modeled is is right. it's almost as if cars are status symbols and people do, are almost embarrassed to walk these days. I don't, um, I don't understand, you know, I walk because I walk my dogs, but I don't know that outside of that, that I took it, that I would walk to a store or, yeah. Or, you know, this idea of living in a walkable city or a city that is, is, is friendly towards walking, um, that is part of an environmental, um, mm -hmm. an environmental piece. And it's also a psychological piece that, and, 
you know, I, I put my dogs on my bike too, but I don't, when I put my dogs on my bike and we go on the bike, um, I don't have a lot of places where I can stop, get off with my dogs and still function around because even in my neighborhood, I don't even see bike racks. Um, so movement is not something that we have emphasized in our culture. When I, when I lived in Italy, there was this thing called fare in passeggiare. And after the evening meal, everyone went into town, everyone right. into the, into the center of the town and they you go to the plaza. Yeah. They just plaza. walked. Old the, family. Yes. Old families. Yes. Yes. It was where they socialized, they met up, everybody walked hand in hand. It, it was, it was a beautiful thing to witness but we don't have the equivalent here. Our society got hijacked by the automotive and the um, gas and petroleum lobbies. So we have, so, so our culture is a car based culture. We don't even have great mass transportation. Other countries have train systems that run all over. So for, and, and so, I would just say, actually, the way our cities are set up, a car is almost a necessity. It's not a luxury. It may be a status symbol, the kind that you get, but it's because most of us don't live close to where we work. So yes, you can bike, but you are gonna face a whole lot of car traffic as you're trying to bike. And for us, a bike lane is a specialty. It's only in certain areas. Other countries where they have bikes and cars, the bikes are right there with the cars. And there's probably a lot of places more bikes than cars. Um, in Italy, it was the scooters. Everybody had a little scooter. I forgot, uh, Vespas. Everybody had Vespas. There were plenty of cars, but there were more scooters than cars, and then there were the bikes. And in Italy, there, is a, as opposed to in America, where there may be in our communities, a church and a bar on every corner, they had a small market on every corner. So people, you, you were not, never far from walking to get your fresh food. And as I recall, the refrigerators were only yay big in Italy. So there weren't big freezers. You didn't buy stuff and freeze you went to the store every two, three days to get your fresh food. And so walking was just a part of their culture. And so certainly in Costa Rica, it's the same thing. And um, in America though, you have to have a car, there's, you know, and so walking is not a part of really what we do. And, you know, I was uh, kind of the joke in the family for a long time because when I would drive someplace, I'm finding the furthest place in the parking lot to park. Yeah. What are you doing? Why are we way back here? <laughs> so we can get, so, you know, um, um, to, to your point, yeah, you walk from the garage to the car and then you, and then when you go someplace, you're looking for that good parking spot, which means the closest one to the entrance. It's not a, it's not a part of our culture. But yes, our natural movement is very, very key just for your joints, just for your knees, just for your hips and your back, just to keep moving. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting, but I think that one of the cities that they um, pointed out in this particular series was also in Singapore. And um, they talked about the, the planning, city planning that included um, this idea of walking. As a matter of fact, they made the cost of driving an automobile so right. prohibitive that people would rather not have automobiles and would rather take public transportation to where they wanted to. Because on top of the payment for the car, you also had to make a payment for 
the privilege of driving a car. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it, it, so their method was as, as they talked about what the government can do in right. order to make sure that people are getting the things that they need or to create this kind of blue zone atmosphere was to build into the system places um, where they could get the movement that you were talking about. They understand the benefits of a healthy population. So they devise a policy to alter human behavior so that whether you want to or not, we're gonna put, make it a part of the culture. And unfortunately, as you know, with our government, the way that that works is, well, if you want to stop using your car, which means that they won't sell as many as much gas and, and oil, you're automatically going to have lobbyists put money in the pockets of those politicians who are going to resist those kinds of changes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, um, you know, how many times has it come up before Congress about extending Amtrak? all across the country. It always gets shut down. And there's no reason why this country as wealthy as it is, could not have a train system that goes to every major city in this country. And you look at Japan, a country like, they have these trains that go, I, I believe it's over 200 miles an hour. So mm -hmm. it only takes two hours to go someplace. <laughs> Mm -hmm. no. mm -hmm. and and it's amazing you know um in in france when i went to paris that was amazing their train system and all of it for the most part is underground you're going down mm -hmm. and you're going down into these different levels where there is trains that go absolutely everywhere and italy um, has a train system it, it does and and, and and it was um um i I went from Florence to Tarkinia because I wanted to go see the Etruscan tombs. Mm -hmm. And the ticket is like $25. It's, it, was, it was so inexpensive to get on a train, go a couple of hours, you know, and to these outlying areas and come back. It, mm -hmm. you know, but again, the policy of the government was we don't want to have a whole lot of congestion on the roads. Let's do this more efficiently than having everybody buy a car, pollute all of our atmosphere with the diesel fuels and the car fuels, put them on trains mm -hmm. and they make it work very, very well. It is, it, it's a beautiful system. And then the one that they talked about in Singapore, one of the things that um, she pointed out was, and, and I mean, everybody can watch this on YouTube, but one of the things that she pointed out is, is that they made even the train stations like a city onto themselves, where you might have grocery stores and all this stuff on the lower level. On the upper level, they had senior housing so that the seniors always had people that were passing by. Yeah. That they never felt like they were outside of or outcast, but rather that they were a part of this. And so there's this constant traffic and movement that is going on right around them. And I just thought that what a what an amazing idea, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. especially when people are here so isolated and feeling um, forgotten about yeah. or alone. Right. So there's the there's that piece, the environmental piece, but you also talked about this idea of stress relief. Um, and, and, and I mean, this is this is something that could probably go on. But wait one second. Um, Vince Vince uh, Robinson is weighing in. He says movement towards walking and biking is also movement toward ownership of cars. The plan is to implement driverless cars that will be provided to passengers at a cost. It's also about limiting movement beyond the restricted zones and is seen by some as a means to control people to create more isolation. Mm. Hmm. So, so this idea of 
um, driverless cars. I, you know, there are so many people that are talking about this driverless car, um, trucks, um, different things like that on our roadways. Um, and, and, and it's, it's really interesting how much people try to automate things to take the human element out. Which... And to increase, and to increase unemployment. Mm -hmm. How many people will be unemployed if, uh, look, look at a city like New, New York, a city which has a thriving taxi cab uh, industry. How many people would be put out of work? And of course, America moves most of its goods by trucks. How many truck drivers? So that makes then these people unnecessary, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's not, um, and putting this in the health context, it's not good for the overall health of the country. And talking about stress, what about these people who are facing unemployment? who are drivers by, you know, that, 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 that's what they've done. They've got their licenses to do this. We've got a whole industry. What happens to that? Do they become the coal miners of the 21st century, obsolete, outdated, and put off into the fringes? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the question is, is where is, where does the pushback from what they think is advancements come from? Is it, it, and if we don't recognize that this is what it's doing or the trend that we're going towards, um, then what happens to that? Um, so uh, Vince says, unemployed people will be on universal basic income and its limitations. Mm -hmm. So, which is also taxing on society. So this idea of, of purpose as well, um, many people in the service industry right. um, would, are, are being displaced. I mean, this is right. an ongoing thing from cashiers to um, bank tellers to, I mean, any number of things. We see this trend that continues to go on and on. And it's important that every that every being have a function. This is something that I do, which not only just helps me, i.e., income, but I'm performing a function which which helps others. I'm engaged. I'm a part of. I'm a part of a system that I help make work that rewards me for my work, but also my work is contributing. I have a purpose. And yes, we have a purpose with our, our, our mates and with our children and grandchildren, but we have an overall purpose for society. That's very important for humans. I, um, there, there's a story that I heard some decades back and it was a young man whose father was a doctor in a rural area. And it was not a very wealthy area. And so a lot of times the patients paid with produce from their farms, whether it was eggs or tomatoes or you know, other items. And so the son asked the father, he said, dad, these people are so poor. Why do you, when you know that they can't pay, accept the other items that they give you. He said, son, it is important for everyone's self-esteem to know they're paying their own way. If you allow somebody not to pay, that hurts their pride and their self-esteem. It makes them feel good that they're paying for the care that they give. And I thought that that was just so profound. Yes. You can, you can let people go away, away, away for free, but for their own self-esteem and pride and backbone, most people like to pay their own way, mm -hmm. to feel that they're earning what they get. Mm -hmm. And so that brings up another curious point because a lot of society, well, people who are or may be on public assistance, 
Um, sometimes I, I wonder about how that plays out in their own psyche when they feel perhaps powerless um, to contribute and the and the psychological damage that that can set up in a person and how they may feel powerless in a system that is already set up to work against them. And, and not just power, well, because we have seen the social studies on the multi-generational families on public assistance, how it seems to follow a trend. And it's not just powerless, but also um, the, the, the self-esteem that I, you know, and, and how that damages a person. So if you are keep giving somebody something, their determination and aspiration to work for it becomes less and less. But now that's the damning part of the system. So the system should be holistic in nature. We're giving you assistance because you need it. But don't you also need maybe a babysitter? Don't you also need some better job skills? Don't you also need some more opportunities? So if, it, so if we're talking about health and wellness, we're going to work on all of those so that the assistance does become temporary. We give you some job skills and we're gonna pay you a salary where you can pay your own rent, where you can pay your own bills. We're gonna give you uh, babysitting that you don't have to pay an arm and a leg for, okay? So that you can go to work and know that your child is safe and it's gonna be taken care of. And we're going to work all of that into the system so that you don't need to keep, get, you can start paying taxes now on what you make instead of taking the money out of the system. And then we can move on to help somebody else. But there's a holistic system in place to give people at that truly that leg up in society and not keep them on the lower rungs of society such that now, now you've got people who have no purpose in life. And we know what that looks like as they become alcoholics and drug addicts because they have, they have no ambition about doing anything else. They've got all this time on their hands and what do they do to feed the loneliness, to feed the despair? They turn to drinking drugs. So, you know, it's interesting because I, you know, as I was listening to you, I thought to my, I, the, the, the thought that came to me was, is that there are plenty of people who are on the system who are able to contribute, but what they contribute doesn't have a social value. And because it doesn't have a value, nobody is paying. So the artists of the world who are not able to get paid for doing their art or people who have a love that they want to do but are not receiving any compensation in return for it, um, find themselves caught up in a system where that doesn't see them nor value them. So you've got terms like starving artists and people that are saying, you know, you know, that are, are, are valuing a person's gifting as invaluable in society. Um, and so I wonder, I wonder too how, you know, because I, I can remember and hearing people that would say, in spite of somebody wanting to do their art, go get a job, you know, as if to say that little stuff doesn't, doesn't carry weight. And that seems to diminish people as well. Absolutely. But remember, um, I forget who the president, was it Roosevelt who started the, the WPA, the workers, the, the uh, public works association during the depression to take people and just pay them to do things. 
it was busy work, but they paid them to just go do, do things. Well, we have in this part of the world, the idea that art is an accessory to life, not a necessity in life. But when you understand the true work of an artist, that is a person who has this faculty open that receives truly a muse, that means something from above coming through them that they can express through their own personality, which actually uplifts the spirit and the consciousness of those exposed to it. So you take artists and give them public works to do, murals to paint, things to design, to put in public spaces such that when somebody else comes in, they feel emboldened, they feel vitalized. Look at that, that's wonderful. So whatever it is, put the, make sure that the art is uplifting to society, recognize the value that that is and pay the artist wages that helps them not become a starving person, but they're a contributing member of society. Mm. I mean, this, but again, if art is accessory, then that means that only the wealthy will be the patrons because they've got leisure time and leisure money. And the guy who's working two jobs, you know, just to keep the roof over his head and feed his children doesn't have time to, you know, go listen to a symphony, go to a jazz concert, uh, go view, you know, to a gallery and just sit around and ooh and ah and maybe buy something. So make it public because it's for the public. Mm -hmm. The more people that see your art, you know, it helps the artist. But our society doesn't value art in that way and that it is a integral part of cultivating a population. Mm -hmm. you, you know, um, and, and I think that that is, you know, the, all of those are such great points. But also one of the things that I noticed about Blue Zones um, is, is that there is a natural beauty in the environments where people are in these zones. Um, there's a natural beauty. And I wonder if, if it is, um, well, all the things that contribute to that natural beauty, is it because of, of what people contribute to the land itself? Is it the backdrop that they live on anyway? Some of these places are um, on the Mediterranean or coastal, different places that are, are beautiful in and of themselves. And I wonder how much that, um, that feeds them as well. Um, th that's an important point to make. So none of these areas are in manufacturing towns with smokestacks, mm -hmm. okay? So there's plenty of fresh air, there's plenty of unpolluted water around. And what you're speaking of is the chi of the environment, the natural energy of the environment that has not been altered with skyscrapers, parking lots, and shopping malls. There are trees and mountains and rivers and lakes and seas and all that energy from the earth, from the air, from the water is what emboldens and actually integrates with the energy of the beings around them. They recognize it and they take care of it. They husband it. They don't cut all the trees down and put a parking lot there and charge people to, you know, to park their cars there. Mm. They, don't they don't treat their home the way other parts of the world treat their home. Mm -hmm. So it has a lot to do with it. And, and it seems really interesting too that this idea where we, um, we sit in front of our TVs and watch other people exercise or do activity. Um, is not something that they that they spend time on. As a matter of fact, I don't know if I noticed TVs in, um, in those areas. 
um, there, what, what we call prime time here is, you know, people sitting down to watch a television show at a particular time after dinner, when in other cultures, they are, that's a social time. It's, right. it's get out and, and be around other people time. It's that's right. relational time. Prime time. Let's redefine prime time, huh? <laughs> you know, I could I could sit and talk to you about this stuff all day, but um, I I need to to um, say we we could talk about this next week. Before I let you go on this one, though, I wanted to um, part of my yoga teacher training. Our homework this month has been to observe not only our tongue scrapings every morning, but also our bowel movements. <laughs> what can be learned from um, looking at these particular things? Well, so um, to your point, our body has seasons which mimic the seasons of the planet. So we have these two basic energies, two basic, um, yeah. I'll use that term, although it's not quite accurate. So we have the moisture principle, which gives us wet and dry. And we have the thermal principle, which gives us hot and cold. So when they intersect, you have four differentiations of energy. You have hot and dry, hot and wet, cold and dry, cold and wet, summer, hot and dry. We're going into fall now. Next week will be the autumnal equinox. Fall is cold and dry. We're going from hot and dry to cold and dry. So our body temperatures, as it gets cooler outside, we get cooler on the inside and our metabolism slows down. When our metabolism slows down, our eating should change. So in hot and dry, to us to keep an equilibrium, that is the fruit season. So we have cold fruit, we have watermelons and we have cantaloupes and we have honeydews and we have peaches and we have plums cold, juicy stuff, juicy because it's dry outside and cold because it's hot outside. Now, as we become cold and dry, if you keep ingesting cold foods, you end up with what the Chinese medicine, they'll call it, you'll have a cold, damp disease. Colds and flus and stuff, why? That stuff that you're scraping off your tongue at this time of the year, if you're eating cold stuff, is mucus. As the body cools down, if you make it colder by, I like cold drinks from the refrigerator at this time of year when it's only 40, 50, 60 degrees, your body's gonna form mucus because of that. Um, so our diets need to change. But some, so, so what can you learn from your bowel movements? So size is one thing to look out for. Color is another thing, but the color, there, there's not too many diseases that really affects color. So size, frequency, is there mucus or not? Is there blood or not? How easy the bowel movements are that your elimination gives you a window into how your GI tract is functioning, which gives you an idea, am I putting in the things that help? Because small stools would indicate, small infrequent stools, not going every day or a couple times a day is indicative of not enough fiber, not enough, and fiber of course is the non-digestible parts of plants. It's the hull of the corn, it's the peel of the apple, it's the peel of the pear and the grape. Um, it, is, it is the um, uh, bran that's in wheat, you know. So 
That's what small stools are. Of course, if, if you see blood, then that's indicative of, you know, a hemorrhoid or maybe a polyp. A hemorrhoid means that then that the, the, the pressure in the abdomen is higher than it should be to get the bowel movement out. Um, color. So if it is black, that indicates that you've had a lot of iron in, 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 in the bowel movement, or it could indicate blood from the upper in, intestinal tract. Small things that come out as pellets is indicative maybe of diverticulosis, having the little pockets that have formed in the colon because you haven't had enough fiber. So those are some of the, you know, and mucus in, 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 in the bowel movement that could indicate a stress disorder because when we get um, stressed and the colon starts to move a lot, it soothes itself by forming mucus. But sometimes if it's also inflamed and irritated or i.e. colitis and irritated colon, you'll see a mucus like that too. So it, you know, that's a good window into what's going on inside my body by looking at carefully what's coming out of my body. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, I could talk so about- It's always this. good. P people always tell me, but I never look where you should. Yeah. Well, you should, because that's how you can tell what's going on internally. Mm -hmm. Look at your bowel movements. If you cough up phlegm, look at it. If you blow your nose, look at it and see, because that's indicative of the, the, the condition that's producing it. Mm, that's so good. I, you know, I could, I could really sit here and talk to you about this for a while, but um, I know that if I, if I don't get off of here, then I'll have problems trying to edit this for... <laughs> For another time. However, um, uh, it's really interesting. A, a friend of mine, she's she's older, much older than I am. And I was talking to her and she said that as growing up, she can remember very well her mother not allowing them to flush the toilet until she has had a chance to inspect yeah. um, their bowel movements. Yeah. Um, which I think is, you know, something very healthy because even just in the few days that I've been doing this, I could tell when I had bread, um, you know, whereas one day I come in and it's, it's very smooth. Um, the next day I come in and I have bread and I get something different. I, mm -hmm. I you know, and I'm just wondering uh, as I watch this, I'll pay attention to what I'm putting into my body so right. I see what I'm getting out. That's right. That's right. Thank you so much for this conversation. You're quite uh, welcome. A yeah, pleasure. We'll pick up on this next week because I want to, uh, before we let go of this blue zone thing. Um, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Have an amazing weekend. And you too. Bye-bye. <laughs> Peace. All right. So thank you so much, uh, Vince. Thank you for uh, your comments. Uh, I appreciate y'all being here. This is so good for me, um, even as I am on my food awareness journey. This is amazingly informative. So um, thank you for being here on this journey with me as well. I'll see you um, when I see you either tomorrow or um, next time Dr. Brown is on with me every Thursday. All right. Take care. Be blessed. And I'll see you soon.